On behalf of the National Endowment for Democracy, welcome to today's discussion on peace and democracy in Haiti. Today, amidst tough news, we want to share with you the bright lights we see coming from Haiti, innovative, creative partners working for a better, more democratic future. NED, after all, is built for tough times. After all, we support the most resilient, courageous activists around the world. So it's a great pleasure to host today some of our Haitian partners, including Observatoire Citoyen de l'Action de Pouvoir Public en Haïti, or OCAP, Défenseur Plus, and Jura Media. They have come together, along with other civil society actors in the country and the diaspora, to promote dialogue and reconciliation and to offer a roadmap for a better future. Haiti is one of those countries where often it's difficult to see progress. Just reading the headlines today is difficult. But I was telling our Reagan Vassell fellow, Abdenel Dudu, recently, that Ned never shies away from what is difficult. Our commitment is to stay with our partners through good times and hard times, most especially through hard times. And Haiti has seen it all. From successive natural disasters to perpetual political instability, the country is now dominated by gang violence, fuel and food shortages, and increasing regional isolation. The international community itself has not always played a constructive role in Haiti, from Haiti's historic origins to contemporary times. So I commend this group today for coming together and offering a homegrown proposal to address the country's most pressing issues. There is hope. There is optimism. There is a sustainable path forward. Here at the Endowment, we are committed to raising Haitian voices and empowering civil society leaders to show us the way forward. Ned started its investment in Haiti in the late 1980s when the country first transitioned to democracy. We've maintained a sustained program since the early 2000s, and our approach is focused on building the capacity of civil society actors to respond to democratic challenges and to serve as interlocutors with decision makers. And so the group of civil society leaders here today it reaffirms our commitment to this approach. We want to help our partners build on Haiti's proud past as the first black republic and the second democracy in the Western Hemisphere to build a more peaceful, democratic, and resilient country. Thank you all for joining us. I'm particularly pleased to be joined by a member of Congress today in the conversation. I want to welcome you all to this. I know it's going to be a powerful presentation, a fruitful conversation. On behalf of the endowment, welcome. Hello. Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Clément Doléac. I'm program officer for the National Endowment for Democracy in the Latin America team. I will be the master of ceremony tonight, and I will be calling upon our partners uh, that have come together tonight to propose innovative solutions and propose an inclusive dialogue to the problems that are currently uh, facing Haiti. Uh, to start with, we will uh, welcome Charles Clermont to come uh, deliver his remark on perspectives Haiti in a context of uh, global fragility. Charles, if you could come in. Uh, wow, what a privilege to, to start here. Thank you very much. Uh, my topic, I'm going to talk about Haiti in a context of global fragility. So uh, by... Uh, ah, okay. <laughs> here it is. Okay. So what I propose to you very simply in the very short period of time, I'm going to do two things. One, let's, uh, let's find what I call an objective view on, on uh, fragility. Uh, so we start, in, uh, in, in order to do that, I've, I've chosen two, uh, two or three uh, uh, perspectives on what is, um, what is fragility. Slide. No, not this one. That's it. Um, that's not the one. <laughs> uh oh. Um, uh, wow, wow. Uh, uh. Wait, oh. 
So I have had two, two assignments. I think I can speak without it, but I think you may need it. You, you, we may need it. Uh, it's going to be short. The, but the first idea uh, I'm bringing is that there, there is a set of criteria which has been set by the World Bank to define fragility. And you will see that when the World Bank think, speaks about fragility, they have three uh, major criteria in mind. One is that you, you are a fragile country if you use facilities from the International Development Association. From this standpoint, and I, know, I don't want to make a joke about it, but you can say that Haiti is overqualified because we, we, go, we use IDA and we don't even have access to the loan, to the soft loans. We, have the, we, we, are only, we are only have access um, to the grants. That's one element. The second part is that the second criteria of the World Bank is that they consider a country as fragile if the country has had a peace mission of the United Nations for three years. Uh, we've had a peace mission, uh, Carl, for, from 2004 to 2017, meaning 13. So, and then they mentioned that you, the, you have to have a, a, a governance ratio and a governance index. And on the governance index, Haiti has been pinpointed for many, many years as being uh, a, a, a country um, uh, with bad governance. So this is what I call an objective view. Uh, the second uh, view, but you won't be able to see that here, is that I brought you a, a picture, and in this picture you will see that Haiti, not only Haiti, but Haiti and some other countries, and we'll talk about them later, is part of what I call the, the hard core of fragility in the world. In, in, in fact, in fact uh, what, what happens is that you have, a, you have five dimensions where you can look at, and some countries may be fragile in one or two dimensions, but the hardcore countries, they, uh, they, are stem to be, they are supposed to be fragile by all of the fine dimensions. Dimension. Dimensions is resilience, uh, it has to do also with, okay, here it is, okay. But if you, if you let me see it, uh, okay, it will be easier for me. <laughs> anyway, you see that it's economic, the institutions, justice, uh, violence, and, and resilience. The, what I want to pinpoint for you is that uh, today we should agree that, uh, uh, and I'm, 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 I'm using... Uh, there is a famous uh, Nobel Prize in economics uh, called Douglas North that some of you economists know that has shown that, you know, uh, one of the key conditions for any country in the world to develop is to set and make stable a set of institutions. In the case, in the case of Haiti today, we have to recognize that most of our institutions are down including an institution which, is, which used to be, years ago, which used to be quite strong, which is the currency, when you say institutions. So if you look at all the institutions organized or not, from this standpoint, we are part of the, of the hardcore that I mentioned. Needless to say that if we talk about the economic situation this morning, uh, Isner Prévial has shown you what, what kind of problems we have, the, the food, food insecurity, et cetera, et cetera. So, for this this uh, justify why we, we are we are set there in the hardcore countries as far as fragility is concerned. Slide. Now the definition that we given by the by the OECD was of interest for me because it 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 captures a, a, a concept that a country is fragile when it's exposed to risks that this institution is not able, it doesn't have the, capability, the capacity to face those risks, be it natural or man-made risks, okay? Like the, the climate erosion and so on, okay? Slide, from this standpoint, okay? Oh, no, excuse me. No, you, you keep the, the OECD slide. I want to share with you one, one point. I don't know if some of you are familiar with the, the Pestel model, when you are making, uh, when you are analyzing an organization, uh, 
uh, a company and so on, and you use, you are analyzing the environment. PESTEL stands for political, economics, social, technological, environmental, and legal. Take PESTEL, put risks, and you see that all of them, in all of them, we do have problems. We have legal risk, political risk, economic risk, social, etc. Okay, let's start. Now let's go to the to the to the idea of the the reason why now in my last two slides I'm asking one question, and and Johnny this morning raised a question which is very important. I'll I'll show you why. Why why do you mention global fragility? The, the, it's because what happened today is the following, is that the, some fragile countries, a lot of fragile countries, are becoming the battlefield for the rivalry between the big power, particularly between the US and China. And you know, one can question why, if you take Haiti, are we today a battlefield? Maybe not, but the Haitians should consider this. Uh, and, and, and Pierre Val this morning, mention a, a, a concern, something which is becoming important for the United States. We need to be able to, to use what they call the nearshoring in order to repatriate a lot of the, the production that has been made in China to get it closer. That's one element. The second element to take into account is that Haiti has a geostrategic position, which is particularly important today when you consider the supply lines coming from Asia or anywhere from Europe. That gives you an idea why we could be, we can be uh, uh, something important. I mean, uh, 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 I wouldn't say uh, an enjeu. I would say that a stake, okay, for, for in terms of global fragility. Last but not least, when you consider slide, when you consider what is happening today, uh, the United States in 2019, there has been a uh, December 19, I believe. Right? was uh, voted the Global Fragility Act, which represents uh, uh, an attempt to change, to switch, really, to make a very important switch in the foreign policy of the United States. A, a country like Haiti is very much uh, interested in, in this, this to happen, really. What I say to happen, really, is this. One of the uh, uh, implications of the Global Fragility Act, in particular, is uh, to take a longer term view regarding foreign assistance by the United States. In, personally, I've had the chance one month ago, I was in Washington, and I had the chance to have a, a talk with the person in the USAID responsible for the 10 year strategic uh, reflection. And one of the questions I have, and that you may have, yes, if today the foreign assistance switch from being a short term endeavor where, you know, after one year, two years, any, even a good project stops because, you know, it stops. And the impact is always quite uh, limited. Today, my, the, I have two questions. Will the United States in general, what will be the implication in the execution of what is required by the, by the Global Fragility Act to the extent that Haiti is one of the countries, there are five of them, Haiti, Libya, Mali, uh, I think Togo or something, uh, Togo and some. Uh, um, what will, what kind of changes uh, uh, is, uh, is go uh, uh, going to happen in the, in the foreign policy of the United States? And in, in the case of Haiti, the question is this. Can we expect a, a change of substance re uh, regarding in the foreign policy of the U.S. vis-a-vis -vis Haiti? I'm not saying it's, it's not going to happen, but you know, we, I believe that we, time will tell. But it seems to me of importance today that while you recognize fragility, you have to wonder, and we should ask ourselves, is it because we are fragile that we prefer to be dealing for peanuts with Taiwan? Or do we have the, the freedom to deal with China? Not to, to be provocative, not to be, we are not going back to a Cold War type things. But we're asking ourselves, what, are the, what is the interest of the country? Should we be dealing with China or should we be dealing with Taiwan? Or should we follow whatever we think is the desire of Uncle Sam? Those are questions for just for your thoughts in the, 
in the context of global fragility. Thank you, Charles. Uh, I will con, uh, call upon Joseph Sani from the United States uh, Institute of Peace to deliver some reflection about lessons learned from other countries. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Charles, for setting the st stage so uh, insightfully. Uh, so I'm Joseph Sani from USIP. Obviously, I don't speak on behalf of USIP. I speak of as a friend of IEC, uh, AEC, and then as um, someone who work on these issues, I'm a good student of these issues of stability and uh, fragility. I will not take too much time just to say, building on what you said, uh, Charles, that there are a couple of things that we can learn from other places, even though hate is very unique. It's unique in the sense that um, we have... As I said before, a protracted state of instability, um, not five years, but decades, uh, even century, and where there is a, a big distrust of the international community or international intervention, uh, rightly so or understandably. We can understand that distrust given the results we have today. So with that in that background, I will try to share some of the, some of the lessons. Uh, but I will insist on two main principles first. What we have learned elsewhere. There are two key things to help move from what you will call fragility to stability or from conflict to peace. One is local ownership. Local ownership of the problem and the solution. And the question then becomes, who is local? Who has to own the problem? That's all. So, I, I will argue that is first the government or the caretaker, but more importantly, the stakeholders who share or are committed to the new vision or the transition that people want to see. Right? Uh, just to back, in my understanding of local ownership, I operationalize it using three key concepts. One is commitment. So I said it's a group of people who are really committed. Two is capacity. You have to be in the position where you have the capacity to actually act on the vision and the, the engagement you want to do. And three is contribution. You have to show that you have a uh, skin in the game. And this is very important in the context of Haiti, right? Because, and very important in the context of international intervention, you can't buy the problem. You can't love the problem more than the, guy, the, the person who owns the problem. You can't own it. They have to own it. And so to, for them to own it, they have to show that they are contributing. So local ownership is key. And at this particular moment for Haiti, I'm hopeful. Maybe I'm just naive, but I'm very hopeful because... What I'm seeing in Haiti is an emergence of new voices, new type of stakeholders, a new ambition. Uh, the work that you are doing with uh, Caf uh, Caful Espoir, for example, Charles, is a commendable work. The fact that we are here with OCA is something that I think we need to build that momentum. So I'm very hopeful that there can be a framework for local ownership in Haiti at this particular moment in time. We should not forget that. I I'm very hopeful. The second principle, or organizing principle, to move from fragility to stability or peace, uh, I think there is the element of a negotiated compact with the international community. And the con international community with large. In the case of AET, not just the core, not just the United States, et cetera, I think we should be in a position where uh, we can the Haitians can negotiate the terms of engagement with others. And that's important. It is important because, remember what I said about local ownership, it also solidifies the agency, right? And, and that negotiating compact is necessary. We have seen it work some in other places, like in Liberia, right? We had a GMAP in Liberia, the Governance and Economic Management Assistance Program, where it was 
focus on five major national companies, but it was a way to crystallize the reconstruction effort and to show that there was, there was some sense, there was a, a shared process to be efficient and to rebuild the country. And then he brought many, it, the, Jima brought different stakeholders together, not just the World Bank, USA, uh, IMF. So there is a compact. There is a way we can build that negotiated compact. And talking of the Global Fragility Act, Charles, that's one key feature of the Global Fragility Act. Not only there is a focus on local initiative, local voices, but there is that element of compact where the U.S. is not dictating what needs to happen, but there is a conversation between the local stakeholders and the United States government. There is a long-term plan aspect to it. It's very critical. And there is also one thing that's important, it is the monitoring and evaluation and the learning component which means we have the right to make mistakes and we can correct them, right? So it's not evaluation for accountability alone, it's evaluation to learn and correct. So I think those features are important in, in, a, in, a compact, in, in, that, in, the, in that compact. And, and so the question then becomes, who should sign the compact? Who should be part of those conversations? And again, the GFA really in, in, encourages an inclusive process. So I'm putting the GFA out there as an example. And the other feature, the, 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 one of the important features of the GFA is also that idea of a pool fund. So it's not just the United States. So the GFA is kind of a catalyzer of resources, right? So obviously the kind of money that we have, um, the government has put on the GFA cannot solve the Haitian problem. I mean, we are talking a couple of millions of dollars. But the idea behind is, can we use this framework to mobilize and catalyze and bring others? So that's why those kind of compacts are important. And they are a critical element of moving from fragility to stability. But they are now, after laying out those key guidelines, those, those organizing principles, I think what we have learned elsewhere, there are a couple of things uh, uh, that can help. You need a stable and inclusive transitional government or transitional caretaker. It will never be fully legitimate or democratic. In some cases, Burkina Faso, Guinea, Chad, but you need to work with some kind of entity to steer that transition. The key here is inclusive and willing to steer the transition towards a democratic path. That's the key, right? But some of them may never, are not elected. I mean, in charge, it's a coup. Cool. I mean, uh, but we need to, to accept the fact that we need to deal with somebody, right? But in an inclusive way and accountability. It doesn't, you don't have to escape accountability. Right? We don't have to sacrifice accountability. But we need to put a premium on inclusion. That is working, we hope. The jury is still out there in Chad, for example. Uh, in Central African Republic, we saw that scenario. So in many places, we have seen those, that, this type of scenario. Number two, you also want to address some dilemmas of prioritization. Because you can't stop, for example, humanitarian assistance until you have a political settlement. You can't do that. You cannot stop. You cannot say, no, let us have security before we get jobs and economic. You can't. So there is a discussion on how you sequence this critical area, political negotiation, meaning constitutional reform, uh, uh, elections, you need to work on security reforms. So there is a way, and that conversation needs to happen maybe within the framework of a national dialogue. How do we sequence things, right? And when I say national dialogue, it's not just people coming together, kumbaya, kumbaya. It's a much more... It, what we have learned elsewhere, the dialogue can take a form of an elite bargain. We saw it in Kenya, where the elite comes together and kind of lay out the framework and then reach out to local communities to engage with them. We can have a full-fledged national dialogue in Central African Republic, for example. In Chad, they tend to do a hybrid where you have some key parties in the dialogue, but we also engage rural area. But we need that conversation. And also, more importantly, where we have seen it work well. So, in, for example, in Rwanda, they prioritize 
humanitarian emergency and accountability at some point. That, and then that's how, for those who know Rwanda, they came up with a solution, like the gachacha, for example, because the court could not absorb uh, the, the number of criminals. So the gachacha process was created to help address accountability issues. And one thing I want to mention in those dialogues, what we have seen is the prioritization of women's voices. I will not say it enough. Women should be considered because they are key actors in the reconstruction process. And sometimes, generally, they are left out of those processes. So women engagement in these processes are critical. I hope the Haitians will be able to do that, to really focus also in how do we engage with women groups. Um, I would, there's more that can be said on the national dialogue uh, processes. USIP has written a lot about those. Um, but again, it's not a kumbaya process. It's a really structured process. It can last from eight days to nine months and can take different forms, elite only or elite, form of elite and rural. I hope in the case of Haiti, given the distrust, the low trust in state institution, a very inclusive dialogue that includes or starts with consultations outside of port au in rural areas and build up into a form of elite-driven conversation may be suitable. But again, we have to analyze the context. Right? So I will end here with where I started by saying that local ownership of this process is key. And I'm hopeful because I see new voices in Haiti emerging. And people will believe that a peaceful and prosperous hate is an idea which time has come. Charles, thank you. <laughs> thank you very much for your remarks. And next we have Guy Serge Pompilus uh, joining us from Haiti. He will be appearing on Zoom behind me. Uh, Guy Serge will speak in representation of the Observatoire Citoyen de l'Action des Pouvoirs Publics au Cap. Thank you, Guy Serge. I'm muted. Okay. That's good now. You hear me? Okay. So thank you uh, very much, everybody, and uh, good afternoon. It's a pleasure to be able, uh, in the name of OCAP, and all the organization that helps us prepare uh, that event uh, to, to speak to you. And I also take the opportunity to thank all the NET staff who assisted us in the preparation and uh, the managing of the, the event today. Uh, my presentation will be around what we call, share my screen. Yes, what we call the manifesto for an inclusive dialogue toward a peaceful transition to democratic and prosperous Haitian society. Uh, as I was uh, telling you, this has been a collective preparation with several uh, organizations. I will speak about them at the end. And to present what we want to be, to, to be a new path to the peaceful transition. Uh, the important word is dialogue. Let's remember that everything, it all started from the beginning with a project from the founders of the Haitian Republic, the Haitian nation. This project was that Haiti was supposed to be, or must be, a land of freedom against oppression and dehumanization, open to all people looking for welcoming land or the mean of self-determination. 
without be being too long on history, Haiti has been that uh, for Miranda, uh, for Jose Marti, and even for the Greek in 1830, and in the 20th century, for Ethiopia, for Libya, and even for the bond of the state of Israel, and so forth and so on, even in the 60s for the independence of the African nations. We've been there for others. Unfortunately, today this project is threatened. It's threatened by violence on all levels, social, economical, political level. The absence of shared interest in civility, which is becoming more and more a problem in the way the society is functioning. Migrations, environmental threats, Haiti is on the corridor, the hurricane corridor, and uh, deforestation didn't arrange the things. And most of this state's failure. So all this is a threat towards the initial project of the founding fathers. What is this, this manifesto about? The manifesto is about connecting. Connecting people, connecting organization, networking, networking in Haiti and networking outside of Haiti. Because for the past decades, Haiti is more than the 27,750 square kilometers. It's part of this United States, part of the Caribbean, and for the last 10 years, part of Latin America, especially in Brazil and Chile. The manifesto also is about adding meaning to conversation. You know, talking about dialogue, dialogue must have a substance, a content. You don't dialogue just to speak, to talk. You want to share, you want to understand, and you want to agree or disagree on contents, on themes, on problems. So the manifesto is about that. And overall, the manifesto is about rebuilding trust because what we had lost, what we have lost in this society is trust. You know, uh, there has been a lot of promise in every liberal constitution. And the last issue is about the 1987 or what they call the amended 1987 constitutions that had a lot of promise, you know, to be uh, an open society with all the rights, you know. And people have seen government after government forget about this promise. They have seen their will or their vote, you know, uh, ignored. So, the manifesto is looking for a new way to rebuilding trust. What is it? How are we going to implement it? The idea is that we found networks of organizations, organizations who agreed to promote, facilitate, and lead an inclusive dialogue between all social, political, and economic sectors of Haiti to foster the emergence of a peaceful, democratic, and prosperous Haiti. Peaceful, democratic, and prosperous. But that will require 
a new way of seeing things, of talking about things. That's why also with the Manifesto, we insisted on the concept of values. We wanted to have, uh, how should I call that? A set of values that will serve as a reference to actions, as indicators of our identity, as well as evaluation criteria for actions. That's what will keep us from getting into deals in dark rooms, into hotels, everything that happened the last years where people say they were in dialogue, they just were making deal and forgetting the people. We deeply think that the reference to those values will be important. And I will just uh, name a few of them, equality, that as son of daughters of Haiti, we are all equals before the law, without distinction. This founding principle is a part of our national republic, our uh, motto, which is liberty, equality, fraternity. This value must constantly be promoted and underlined. The second one is inclusion. We each have equal standing as full-fledged sons and daughters of Haiti. Neither our place of birth nor our beliefs, our origins of our gender should constitute barriers to participation in the life and future of our communities. However, belonging to the national community entitles us to our rights, but it also gives us commensurate duties. The other one is openness. Although different as individual, we accept to hear and understand the other. We accept to examine the ideas, to react to the actions without prejudice. We agree to change our point of view on an issue when this is warranted. And finally, the one I want to really emphasize is tolerance. As products of different life stories and experiences, we will come across behaviors that are new to us and perhaps that we will reject, that we will reject. As sons and daughters of Haiti, we are ready to accept that the other person is different and that disagreements may exist. Of course, this assumes the common recognition of the intolerable. Is that, does that, that doesn't mean that tolerance means that we accept everything. There are things that are not acceptable. When we doing harm, doing harm to the others, to other people is not acceptable and is not subject to tolerance. Uh, there are other ones that uh, you will see in uh, by reading the document. I want to move on uh, to what we call strategy and springboard for action. Taking a fresh start will require that we bring together, we connect and we intervene for two things. Thus, uh, first, to promote new responsible and respectful behavior. This is the first thing that we're looking for. The second is to promote awareness and commitments for new responsible and respectful behavior. So one thing is to promote them. The other one is to have awareness and commitment. The second level of uh, our springboard for action is to bring on board and motivate national or foreign personalities. Which one? Because in order to benefit from the contribution of individuals who have experienced crisis situation, we are not alone in this world. Yes, we are an island, but in other parts of the world, people, uh, you know, cross or live difficult situation, uh, civil wars, uh, catastrophe, natural, natural disasters. So 
we 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 must learn how to connect with people able to share that. And I think Joseph Sani for his presentation just a while ago. This is exactly what we want to learn from the others. And also those people should inspire Haitians in the effort to resolve their differences and conflicts peacefully. In Latin America, in Africa, in other parts of the world, people had conflicts and they were able to move on and to adopt a new path. Uh, the third level is, I put several things in it, is first to communicate, inform, and disseminate. Uh, we are a society where we like to keep secrets. We like to think that information is power, so you don't share information. No, in the 20th, 21st century, information is is there to be shared. This is the way we move about it. We want also to facilitate and promote, promote the implementation and so, of social and economic initiative at every level. The idea is that when you want to uh, put people into sharing, into dialogue, they have to build something together. Something built together stays, you know, it becomes the property of the community. And so we want to promote that kind of economic and social initiative. And at last, we want to connect with decision makers and influencers abroad on Haitian affairs. Uh, Yes, it's important that Haitians uh, choose and discuss between themselves. But Haiti is not in a vacuum. Uh, Charlie uh, Clermont, uh, just a while ago, in that context on global fragility, was showing how we're part of the world. We're part of the ongoing fight. So we must reach and rebuild our diplomacy in a way to speak to everybody, to all that, all those who can uh, support Haiti. And finally, when we want to change, when we want to adopt a new point of view, we need an organization. You know, I like a lot that uh, this is originally in Spanish, a poem by uh, the Spanish uh, poet Antonio Machado, which was telling traveler, there is no path. The path is made by walking. In fact, if I wanted the English equivalent, an American equivalent, is that we don't want just to talk the talk. We should also walk the walk about delivering. And delivering is about emergence, you know. We are not a political party. We are not a coalition. This is, we're building a coalition of civil society organization, civil society umbrella organization. So we cannot have something very rigid. We're supposed to be to connect organization and people locally, nationally, and the diaspora with few rules, frequent adjustments to public actions and prevailing conditions. The rules will vary, provided that they respect the values. And this is the most important things. This is a way of not being, you know, uh, stuck in organization uh, rigidity and being able to, to talk to everybody. Because conducting a dialogue is that we don't want to 
earn any, you know, political advantage from it. The idea is, uh, is to be a group of people facilitating the transition of Haiti from where we are now to where we want to be. Uh, organization adhering to the manifesto for the inclusive dialogues, those organizations agreed to meet during the next three months to produce two things that will you know, be useful. First is a theory of change for inclusive dialogue. How do we move from where we are to where we want to be based on uh, evidence, based on experience, and not just opinions. This is the first thing. And from there, to adopt a plan of action to implement the inclusive dialogues among all the sons and daughters of Haiti to transition peacefully toward a democratic and prosperous society. This is what we're going to do next, the next step which we want to take in the coming weeks, coming months. And for this, I want to thank especially uh, the group of umbrella organization. Uh, thanks, uh, Kaful Espoir. Thanks to FOD. Thanks to the Georgia Haitian American Chamber of Commerce. Thanks to SSBP. Thanks to HM3. Thanks to, and also other, thanks to Defenseur Plus, Rifraca, OCID, and really all those who made this event possible and agrees to discuss the contents of the manifesto. So this is it. This is what we put on the table and we want to share that what we want to be a productive path to a new Haiti, to a Haiti where the initial projects of the founders will get a new meaning for all Haitians, girls, boys, men, women from Haiti or from its diaspora. Thank you very much for giving me the time to share this with you. Thank you very much, Gisers, for your intervention. It was really interesting, and we look forward, everyone, discussing around this manifesto. Our last speaker for tonight is Johnny Celestin, and he will speak on a path forward to organize the Haitian diaspora. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, first, I want to say thank you to uh, Guy Serge for sharing his thoughts, um, really um, well laid out um, approach to the manifesto and the way in which this coalition is going to move forward. Um, I want to say thank you to our host, uh, Ned, for making us welcome and giving the space for um, us to come together and have this very important conversation. And of course, I want to thank all of you for making, um, for taking the time for being here and many of you who are watching this. Thank you. Um, I am Johnny Celestin, and I have the privilege to talk on behalf of the diaspora um, right after Guy Serge has shared um, his view of the manifesto. Um, and I'll try to do so as quickly as possible in five minutes or less, but I want to situate us in this conversation. Um, as a diaspora, obviously many of us understand that we have a large uh, population of Haitians living outside of the country. Um, this migration actually took place essentially in multiple phases, five, um, that I would, I would group them in. Um, the first is during the Duvalier era of 1957, 1986, where the economic elite um, and the educated went to study abroad. The second um, uh, was um, between 19, 1986 to 2010, 
um, where a lot of the sort of the, the working class really uh, uh, migrated out of the country and um, because of the difficulties, the economic situation. Um, the third that I would highlight is uh, what's happening now, and I would probably look at it post-2010, um, which happened after the earthquake, and now with the insecurity. Um, there were two more which were happening before 1957 that I don't need to talk about. So um, the second thing I want to highlight is the importance of the diaspora. When we think about the diaspora, quite often we talk about remittances that the diaspora sends. Um, the central bank shared some data between 2010 and 2020. Um, the diaspora sent about $23 billion back to Haiti, which is a lot of money that is sent into Haiti, but all of us can acknowledge that that money has not had the kind of impact on the country that we all um, had anticipated. Um, this money really went into what we would call a poverty reduction, and none of it re really went into economic growth. And that's a major challenge that those of us who are in the diaspora who are interested in seeing a, a renewed Haiti needs to really think about. And of course, because um, this money flows through Haiti, never stays, it really is in contradiction to what we often hope to have. Um, and so this money helps our families and our friends and help uh, 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 to, to sort of keep the country afloat. On the other hand, this remittance causes a lot of uh, structural imbalance in the country. So as we think about um, uh, the diaspora, there are some things that we can do that we need to think about. But there are some limitations within the diaspora. We come from the same place, but there's a lot of sort of social, structural uh, gap and, and division between us that needs to be resolved. Um, of course, the diaspora is a sleeping giant, um, but often it feels like it's a little mouse. Um, it is unable to gather its forces in order to influence um, social or political or economic policies in Haiti. Um, we've not been able to bridge the political um, uh, gaps that exist. And in fact, many of the issues that have been on our own agenda have never really made it uh, into the political agenda. And quite often, to be honest, the local actors see the diaspora as an external actors and the issues of mistrust that exist in the country um, exists also between the diaspora and those who are local and exists within the diaspora itself. So many of the gaps, many of the challenges and division that came from the country are replicated in the diaspora. So these are issues that we need to resolve ourselves. So what role for us is my last piece? Um, it is true that there is this, it, this um, remittance distortion, which is what I call it, um, but the diaspora does contribute socially and economically, and we need to figure out how do we leverage that. And what that means is that even with our diversity, even with the challenges that we face in terms of having an engaged diaspora, and despite those differences, we are all very interested in making sure that Haiti is a place that works, it's safe, and it's growing. And so what we need to consider, um, we'd like to say, engage in political action, help to influence state actors, particularly in Haiti, because they are there, they are running the country, so we need to be able to hold them accountable, advocate for justice, um, advocate for accountability, and I think that it would be important for us to consider this uh, proposal that Guy Serge put forward, this framework that he put forward, particularly within OCAP, for all of us to kind of bring organization, organizations together from the diaspora to have this common framework that can help change um, uh, this, uh, the framework that currently exists in Haiti. So with that, I say to the diaspora, we have work in front of us, but we need to be involved, we need to be engaged, and I think OCAP is ready for all of us to participate in the process. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Thank you very much, Johnny. And now we'll hear from uh, Carl Alexand from the Haitian United Council as closing remarks. Thank you very much. Um, I think each of the speakers who have uh, spoken uh, before me just now have uh, really highlighted some of the rich discussion 
that we've had uh, uh, today. So I'm not going to um, spend a lot of time talking about uh, uh, you know the blow by blow about what happened today. However, I just want to share with you some of the impressions that I'm left with uh, during the course of the day today. We started with uh, um, uh, conversations about the political, economic environment in Haiti. And one of the things that I'm left with after this conversation is that there seems to be a consensus about the big picture issues that the country faces. There may be some nuances about the solutions, but the big picture issues have uh, really been crystallized, at least in my mind, and I hope in yours as well. From the conversation and as a way of summary, I think it is fair to say that all of the speakers earlier today um, identified the multiple perilous uh, crises that Haiti faced, a political crisis, a security crisis, an economic crisis, and a humanitarian uh, crisis. All of this is overlaid by what some of the speakers mentioned as the government's absence in terms of helping to find solutions and credible uh, 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 solutions uh, to the problem that the country uh, faces. A speaker has even said something along the lines that the, um, uh, the government is not meeting expectations. And that's a pretty serious uh, 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 statement. Similarly, others, several others, have talked about the lack of leadership that has, exi that has existed in the country for far too long. And all of the speakers have understood the key role that security plays in resolving many of the issues. Security alone is not the entire solution, but it is a first step uh, to getting to uh, yes, if you will. On the security issue, there have been some very important figures articulated uh, 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 today. 1,700 schools closed. 500,000 kids have lost access to education. A thousand, a thousand homicide in six months. Hundreds of other um, um, we're talking about homicides as well as, if I can find my notes uh, very quickly, um, uh, there were like hundreds of other incidents requiring state action which have not uh, been taken. For these reasons, during my presentation to the group earlier today, I advocated for, I highlighted the problem with the security uh, uh, sector and the fact that there are some 160 gangs operating on the territory of Haiti. 94 of these gangs are operating in Port-au-Prince. And there are reports from the law enforcement community that between 50 to 60% of the Port-au-Prince metropolitan area is under the control of gangs. 
Port-au-Prince is the capital city of the country. This situation is not acceptable. And in my remarks earlier today, I advocated for the government to devote its resources to deal with the problem. Initially in Port-au-Prince, which will take somewhere between 300 to 400 law enforcement officers, because the amount, the number that they have currently is just not adequate. The SWAT team of the Haitian National Police has been doing anti-gang operations, and that unit only has 105 officers. Some of them are not even operational, leaving only 80 officers to really uh, conduct operations. During the course of the conversation, it was correctly pointed out that, you know, using police authority to solve the gang problem in Port-au-Prince is not sufficient, and I agree. I agree because if you don't replace the gangs by government services, you're likely gonna end up with the same problem all over again. All the exchanges that we had today have been very enriching, to be uh, very frank with you. But the most enriching experience that I'd like to leave you with is the spirit of collaboration that I think is emerging from the discussions that we had today. Although we disagree perhaps in the margins on the way to go about solving problem, there is plenty of room, plenty of room for us to get together come to a consensus on an approach to help Haiti move forward in the 21st century. With that, I thank you immensely for the opportunity to get to know you today, and I look forward to our continued collaboration. Thank you very much. And finally, I will invite uh, Fabiola Cordova to come to the podium. She is the Associate Director of the Latin America team at the NED. Thank you, everyone. And I know we're a little over time, so I'll be very brief. But it's really been a pleasure to have you all at NET today. And like uh, Damon Wilson at the beginning on his pre-recorded uh, remarks said, um, this is your home. This, we are all friends of Haiti, and I hope you can count on us uh, to help you in that path forward that you're setting up for yourself. And maybe I wanted to take three uh, comments that were discussed earlier today that have really stayed with me and that I think hopefully guide your next steps. Somebody said today, we don't all need to agree to collaborate. I thought that was so powerful. Um, we can still, you know, we still agree on helping Haiti move forward, even if we're not 100% aligned on all the strategies, you know, that should not be a deterrent to, um, to collaborate. And, you know, in that direction, just moving in the right direction is enough, even if you're not all going in unison. Um, another thing that somebody said that I thought was very powerful is that we really need to ch challenge our paradigms. Um, we have been working under some assumptions for a long time, Maybe now is the time to shake up the way we perceive uh, both the countries, the solutions, and the actors. So I really invite you to, to challenge your paradigms. And finally, something that Joseph just said in his presentation I thought was so powerful as well, that we have the right to make mistakes and correct them. And that we want to monitor those mistakes, not as a form of accountability, but as a form of learning. And I think that is also so very important and something that I hope will help you in, in, this, in this path uh, forward. Thank you again all for coming and participating both in the day-long conversation on Haiti and in this last uh, public event. I know that um, Haiti has a bright future, and we just want everybody to kind of work together 
following our Haitian, our Haitian civil society leaders as they show us a path forward. Thank you very much for coming.